I know the title in your program was Big Chim Update, but I actually want to talk to you a bit more about the research you've been doing also on just injuries, packing, ways to decrease it, as well as the big chimming research. Um, just to give you an idea of what SRUC has been doing, we're based in Scotland, so we sometimes do lack presence down here. I'd also like to point out that we've been recently rebranded as well. So right now I work at SRUC, or Scotland's Rural College. And we might know us better as SAC, or the Scottish Agricultural College. We're still the same company, same people, but we've added a few more colleges in Scotland to us, and with that we've been rebranded, just to add to your confusion. So just to give you an outline of my talk, I'll give a brief introduction, and I know what I'm going to say in the introduction will be old news to some of you, but just to make sure we're all on the same page and that you understand what I mean when I use terms. I'll talk about injuries, pecking, and beak trimming research that we've done at SRUC, and I'll also update you on other injuries, pecking, and beak trimming news, including Christine's um, beak trimming, or bum, uh, clock trials, and I'll just, I'll just kind of make some general conclusions from that. So now, when I'm talking about injurious pecking, um, I'm using it to cover a number of different things, all of which are poor for bird welfare. So it includes feather pecking. Now there actually are two types of feather pecking. It can be gentle, where the feather is nibbled, almost in a preening-like or allopreening motion, or severe, where the feather is severely, um, vigorously pecked at, sometimes removed, and sometimes consumed. And it's the severe feather pecking that is a problem. Bird's gentle feather pecking doesn't seem to have any relation to late propensity to peck um, injuriously. I'm also including um, vent pecking, toe pecking, and any type, type of cannibalistic pecking when I talk about injurious pecking. Now what affects injurious pecking? As I'm sure you all know, it's a horribly multifactorial issue, making it one that's quite difficult to always control or manage. So the environment does control it. We know that foragers are quite important in decreasing um, injurious pecking levels, and research has given us good evidence that feather pecking um, is most likely redirected foraging behavior, or a way of the bird um, expressing a behavior that's motivated to perform when an appropriate outlet isn't present. However, it's also affected by things like flock size, stocking density, light intensity levels. We know there's a genetic component of feather pecking. You can take birds, and select them on the propensity to feather peck, and you can establish low feather pecking and high feather pecking lines. Of course, this isn't being done with, with, with regards to production, so it's not like you could just go get your low feather pecking line and, and use it in your sheds and everything would be great. But it's important to remember there's a genetic component. So depending on the strains you have and how you're keeping them, um, it might affect their pecking propensity. Nutrition also affects pecking. Um, feed type com composition, uh, whether it's a mash or a pellet, as well, early life experiences affect pecking. So things like early exposure to a good quality forage can help have protective effects later in life against pecking. But really, any kind of dramatic change, or small change even, or anything that's going to stress the birds has the potential to cause an injurious pecking outbreak. So current methods to manage and prevent this problem are obviously the beak trimming, which is the removal of the sharp tip of the beak. And this decreases the ability of the bird to pull and um, grasp and pull out the feathers. We also provide enrichments to the birds. So these are items that fulfill bird motivation and just increase in environmental complexity and give the birds just more to do in their environments. You can also get beak abrasives. And if you've been to um, our stall in the hall there, Krista has an example of a board with beak abrasive on it. And it's kind of like a nail plow for the beak. So the birds peck it, and the tip can be worn down naturally. Now, beak trimming is obviously quite a hot topic right now. There are problems with it. We know that it's painful, and this isn't just the hot blade trimming. The infrared beak trimming has also been shown to be acutely painful. It's also considered a mutilation, so removing part of the animal. So you've got a very negative term there that um, beak trimming comes under. There's bad public perception about it, again, because it's considered a mutilation and because there are some horrible pictures that are quite easy to Google with birds with large pieces of their beaks removing. Um, another problem with beak trimming is that it's not actually stopping bird-to-bird -bird pecking. So your beak trim birds will still peck each other, um, they just can't do as much damage. So you're not actually solving why the birds want to peck each other, you're just making it more difficult for them to damage each other. As well, you do have the potential for regrowth, meaning another trim, 
and in this case from the older, will be heart blade, which is associated with both acute and chronic pain and neuroma formation. So I'm quite sensitive uh, nerve bundles in the beak. However, of course there are benefits to beak trimming or you wouldn't be doing it in the first place. As I said, it decreases severity of pecking damage, and it decreases bird injury and mortality levels, which of course is also great for bird welfare. And the infrared beak trimming is of course an improvement over hot blade. It's not perfect, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. So just to go over some experiments that we've done to decrease injurious pecking at SNRC. I'll start with talking about one of my master's students' projects, Mary Baxter. And this was done in association with the University of Edinburgh. And kindly, she was funded by the WPSA Summer Vacation Scholarship um, to help her stay with us at Auckland Crew during this project. And she looked at the role of enrichment in improving laying hand and pullet welfare. And her aims were to determine if the provision of additional enrichment items would decrease injurious pecking behavior, to assess the use of different enrichment items, and determine the effect of the bird age on enrichment use. So all birds were provided with wood shavings so they can forage, and as I said, we know litter quality is important. All birds were also given a perch, and they had a fairly basic nest box, which may or may not have completely filled any, fulfilled any nesting needs. Now we also gave them um, a polypropylene rope to peck, which I know is a standard enrichment in, in production systems. Um, it was part of our know, home office license that the birds did need to be kept under certain criteria. So we gave them this rope to peck as well as something to do. So all birds were provided with these things. Then they were given additional enrichments, just giving these one, one um, item at a time. Um, so the birds also were given cabbages. It's a more natural forage and it's also got a high fiber content. Um, and it might need foraging needs more than wood shavings. And we decided on cabbage after talking to some of our local producers, our stock workers, and there are actually published peer-reviewed articles recommending cabbages as a potential um, way to decrease injurious pecking. We also provided the birds with sand baths because we know sand is preferred to dust bathe in over wood shavings. So it might be the dust bathing needs more than just straight wood shavings. We also gave the birds in another type of nest box, one that we felt should be preferred. So it's fully enclosed, it's got some bedding, but we only included this as a possible pilot for another grant we were putting into, so I'm not actually going to go into detail about um, any of the nesting results. We also looked at two types of age. We had pullets between 10 and 13 weeks, and hens between 58 and 63 weeks age. And we know that rearing environment does set up an effect on later environment, or later behavior, pardon me. But we want to see if the pullets and the hens will have the same enrichment needs and usages. Because obviously if you're going to be adding something to your barn, it's going to be more expensive, so there's no point in adding it if the birds aren't going to be using it or if it's not going to be helpful. So just really briefly what we found was overall the hens performed more injurious pecking than pullets, which of course you expect because as the birds age, pecking does increase. And the pullets were just less active overall and showed a lot of comfort behaviors in resting. So they, they perched, they um, sat, they preened. And this might be an artifact of the low lux levels of the pullets who were being reared in compared with the hens. Um, the birds with no additional enrichments performed more injurious pecking. So what we were providing was giving them more to do and directing them away from bird to bird pecking. And we found the sandbox was the most used additional enrichment. And we were a little surprised because from people we were talking to, we thought the cabbage should actually do really well. But the birds either really loved it and pecked at it a lot and we did have to replace it, or they seemed a bit fearful of it or didn't know what to do with it. The hens also spent a lot of the time foraging the wood shavings. And of course, these are good quality shavings. They were freshly pretty when the birds were brought in. But we did find that the other enrichments further decreased the injurious pecking. So just providing your birds with a nice thick layer of wood shavings isn't enough on its own. The hens also made a lot of use of these ropes. And again, if you go to our stall, Chris has brought an example of the type of rope we use as well. Um, however, there are some downsides to the rope. In this shed, unfortunately, we did have a, a fair uh, sized red mite population. And when we were moving the ropes, we did find a lot of red mite living in the ropes. Um, our farm manager was actually quite against the ropes because he was concerned they were a choking hazard. And this stems back to a trial that we did years ago 
on our free range research facility. Um, and the birds weren't actually given rope um, as any type of enrichment, but somehow bailing twine got in the range and it ended up wrapped around a bird's beak. And so he was quite concerned that our rope was going to act similarly. Um, however, the rope was fine and we've used it in other studies as well, but it's just to note that the type of rope, if you're going to use it as enrichment, is quite important. <coughs> So what we found from this study was the importance of having a good quality forage in a dry, dusty area for dust bathing. Now, in your free range, on your range, you probably do have dusty areas, but depending on the weather, and especially where we're at in Scotland, there's going to be a good chunk of the year where that's not dry and dusty, it's going to be a wet puddle. So possibly considering indoor areas that can be kept dry and dusty to fulfill the dust bathing needs. And just making the environment complex and increasing behavioral opportunities and giving birds more to do to take up their time will help decrease enduring pecking rates. And one possible concern was that the pullets didn't really interact with the enrichments as much as the hens. And now we know rearing environment is important, and we know that we want our rearing environment and our lay environment to be as similar as possible. Um, but if we're introducing these enrichments to the pullets and either A, they're not using them, it's then a waste of money, it's not useful for the pullet, and it also might not make the transition into the lay house as smooth as it could be if they're not using the enrichments when we first introduce them. And next I'll talk about another master's student, Jennifer Bain, who looked at pecking block enrichments. And this is entitled An Investigation into the Use of Pecking Blocks as Environmental Enrichment Devices for Laying Hands. And she hoped to determine the suitability of pecking blocks as enrichments and determine the effects on injuries, pecking, and other bird behaviors. So she had two types of blocks, and these in the pictures actually aren't her blocks. But she took hers in her sheds, and the light quality was, was low, and the pictures were actually quite hard to see, so I've just stolen these off the internet. But it's a similar size block, it just looks a bit different. So they were 10 kilos each, and were 40 by 25 by 15 centimeters. And they were comprised of limestone, molasses, and grain. And the two types of blocks just differed in the proportion of maize and wheat content. So one block had the kibbled wheat, so it was a very uniform colored block. The other one had um, cracked maize and whole wheat, so the block ended up being quite speckled. And these were introduced when the birds were 30 weeks of age and provided for eight weeks. We also looked at data before the block blocks were provided and afterwards to look for changes in behavior. <coughs> and we did find that one block type was used more than the other, and it was the one with the speckled appearance most likely because that is more attractive to the birds or interesting to peck. As well, pieces could be broken off more easily, so there was more feedback for the birds as well. Um, just block presentation increased overall foraging behavior, most likely because pieces of the block were ending up in the litter, so stimulating more foraging. And the birds continued to be interested in these blocks over the eight weeks they were provided. So sometimes we do have problems in enrichment where initially they get a lot of attention. But over time, the birds habituate, and then attention drops off, so they're not being as effective. But these blocks um, continue to be used throughout the whole trial. Um, the higher use block it did have to even be replaced after six weeks, uh, most likely <coughs> though, because its pieces were breaking off and it was able to be decimated faster. And overall, the injury spectrum was quite low in this flock. Um, but the proportion of birds engaged in injury spectrum was lower when the blocks were present than when they weren't. And this is even when they were older, when we looked at the behavior after blocks were removed. And this is the part of the trial where I was chatting with Jennifer when I was getting ready for this presentation. And she felt that her flocks that she gave the pecking blocks to performed well and had good feathering. And it's her main job to manage free range head sheds, hen sheds. And she's decided that she's going to keep using these blocks with her sheds. Now, the downside, of course, is that it potentially could get expensive. Um, right now, it was estimated about five pounds per block. However, this was us just getting the blocks just for this study. If you're going to buy them in bulk, um, unit costs may come down. And you can actually even look online or go to um, talk to your, your feed producers seeing about getting your own blocks made and perhaps doing it for, for lesser amounts or within a, a different budget. And again, they do need replacing over time, so there will be a bit of extra work. It's not like you can just put them in and leave them for the duration of lay. You have to check on them and then replace them if needed. Um, and in this picture, you can see the bird is actually sitting on top of the block, which does mean that she may defecate on the block 
and then the birds peck at it again. So it's not ideal. You don't ideally want birds pecking at things contaminated with feces. Um, the last study I'm going to talk about is actually a colony cage study, but the results from this are going to help um, determine whether or not this beak trim, trim ban will go ahead in 2016. So I still wanted to talk to you about it and let you know the results, because it's certainly not just going to be the free-range results that influence the decision. It's going to be results from all hands. And this is Krista Morrissey's PhD project, and Krista is here with me today. Some of you may have seen her. Um, it's in collaboration with the University of Guelph in Canada, um, where we've actually, I've got my PhD as well, just ironically, so we're uh, representing Ontario quite well. And the aims of this project were to assess behavior, feather condition, mortality, and enrichment use. And she has a few different treatments. She's looked at different breeds, highline and lower, <coughs> pardon me, um, whether the birds were beak-trimmed or not and whether um, there was extra enrichments provided in the environment or not. So, just to tell you what I mean, when I'm talking about a colony cage or a furnished cage with no extra enrichments, I just mean the cages you would buy from the manufacturer. So including the nest boxes or the nesting areas, including your perches, and including these scratch mats where feed gets dumped couple times a day to stimulate foraging and dust bathing. When we added extra enrichments, and these are available at our stand as well if you actually want to see what they look like, we added ropes to the cages, pecking mats, which are chipped wood with a non-toxic glue so the birds can actually peck pieces off so there's feedback there and it's non-toxic <coughs> and the wood just adds fiber to the bird's diet. And there's these um, pecking boards, the big blunting boards, with a beak abrasive on them, so as the birds <coughs> peck it on the whole foot again, that the beak would wear naturally. And this is, these are just pre preliminary results. Just is still in the middle of her trial. It's not going to be done until next January. But this is from when we started going at week 15 of age, when the birds were placed, up into 60 weeks of age. And it just breaks down the different treatments. So whether it was a high line or low line, whether they were trimmed or not being trimmed, and whether they were in a, a cage with extra enrichment or with no extra enrichments. And I mean, overall, the mortality is pretty good. It's quite low. We did have a few higher mortalities with the low and non-trimmed, and even one with low and trimmed that was a bit higher. So just to break this down a bit into our, our treatments, again, overall, the low men had higher mortality and a higher pecking-related mortality. Looking at whether they were trimmed or not trimmed, the non-trimmed birds had a higher overall mortality, and again, a higher pecking-related mortality. And whether the birds were kept in the cage with no extra enrichment led to a higher mortality and higher pecking-related mortality than if they were in a cage where we added the extra enrichments. Now, we actually ended up having to cull two cages due to peck-related mortality. They potentially could have been emergency being trimmed, um, but the managers decided that they, they would like to call the birds at this point. And they were both low and non-trimmed. And although enrichment did affect overall mortality, we did have one in an enriched and one in just a standard cage. And the mortalities got up to between 10 and 12 and a half percent, with peck related mortalities between six and a quarter and eight and three quarters. So <coughs> following this, um, we increased our bids to keep a better eye on the flock. And we also decided to take any carcasses or dead, dead birds found in the treatment birds um, back to our campus so they could be PM'd by our vet. Because the, what, I, what I'm calling previously as mortalities was what the stock workers felt were the mortalities and the reason the birds had died. And we just wanted to be sure that um, what they were saying was the reason the birds died to make sure that these results are accurate. This is the feather score of the birds. Again, for the visit, starting on week 19, and these are up to 59 weeks of age. The blue is the high line, and the gray is the low one. And the lower um, number is a good feather, and the higher is poor feather, so obviously you want lower. And over time, both birds have decreased in feather score. Low one was slightly higher, but most likely once we do statistics to this, that's not going to come out as anything significant. Now, if you look at the trimmed versus non-trimmed, again, the feather score on the different visits, 
yellow being trimmed and red being non-trimmed. The birds with the intact beaks did again have higher feather scores, and the size of this difference is potentially a, a true result, so there actually is most likely a difference in your feather score when your birds have beaks or not. And this is just to combine these results. I know this graph looks a bit complicated, but again, it's feather score, looking at whether it's a high line with trimmed or not trimmed, and a low one with trimmed and not trimmed. And overall, for both strains, when the birds were not trimmed, they had higher feather scores than when the birds were trimmed. And again, low one was just slightly higher than high line, but the trim obviously is having an effect overall there. And when we look at our enrichments, um, even though they did seem to affect mortality rates, uh, they don't seem to be doing anything for feather score. So the yellow was the extra enrichment, and the purple was the standard colony cages, and there's really no difference there in feather score in the birds. Um, just a bit about the behavior we observed, because we also did um, focused observations on what the birds were doing. Now, we didn't actually see any event of cannibalistic pecking while we were there. And obviously there was some, because there were deaths and we even had to cull those two cages. Um, but it wasn't so obvious that you saw it whenever you went to the shed. Also, we didn't see them use the enrichments a lot either. Um, looking at the enrichments for wear and tear, again, it does seem like they did use them, but we didn't observe it a lot. And things that seemed to increase the injurious bird to bird pecking was the week or the age of the bird. So as the birds age, they pecked more, which you would expect. Um, the birds being low did seem to increase their pecking. But I would like to maybe caveat here that these are treatment sheds within a larger shed of highline birds. So obviously the shed is being managed for highline. And that might be why it looks like low are performing worse here, because they're actually being managed as highline birds. <coughs> Um, as well, when the birds were in the non-enriched environments, they seemed to have more injuries for to bird pecking. So what Chris is hoping to do next, starting early next year, is then to identify nutritional aspects related to injuries pecking. So look at fiber stores, um, animal base versus plant based protein levels, and actually the protein levels should be animal based versus plant based. I mixed that up. Uh, fiber source, standard versus reduced, fiber inclusion, um, and also just looking at things like what makes up the enrichment. So the type, where it's placed at, sizes, and to see if we can increase enrichment use. Because again, if we're going to include enrichments, they need to be used. There's no point in putting the effort or money into it. So I'm just going to talk a bit about other injuries packing and beach in the news. Now again, this isn't my research. I've spoken to people about it, so I can potentially try to answer some questions, but I'm obviously not the best person to contact about these. There was a Big Trim Action Group meeting last week. Um, it was mainly just updates on scientific research, so Krista presented her results. Christine Nickel was there and discussed her results, and the RSPCA um, also talked about their show rail program. <coughs> So talking about Bristol's study, it's a DEFRA-funded study. They've managed to recruit 20 intact beak flocks, and their goal is to provide farm advice, management, and enrichment strategies tailored to the individual systems before and during rear lay. And they visited these farms at age 20, 40, and 60 plus weeks of age to look at mortality levels, plumage, and bird behavior. And they're also planning on conducting cost-benefit um, analysis at the end. And their criteria, and this is just for study purposes, we're not saying this is what we expect your criteria to be on your own farms. But at the end of lay mortality, they considered anything under 5% to be good. Acceptable was 9 or less, and unacceptable was over 9. And right now they currently have 16 flocks in lay. Um, they're all in different stages of the production cycle. Some are beginning, some are nearly done. And five of these flocks have beak trim batch controls. So what that means is basically they're same enrichment, same environment, same management, but these birds have been beak trimmed instead of being left intact. So 14 of the 16 birds had no reported problems, everything was fine. Um, one flock had a couple of pet injured birds when they were aged early 20 weeks. It was a low mortality overall, but they had a bit of a spike. And so Bristol took remedial steps gave them further advice, added and modified the enrichments. Um, for example, move the enrichments to area of high packing to distract the birds, replace wet litter with dry, and so on. And that seemed to solve the problem for this flock. 
and as of last time they spoke to them, everything was fine. I did have a flock that had a bad and nearest pecking outbreak with a mortality of over 25%, which is, of course, quite high, especially with that number of birds. Um, these birds were showing high levels of pecking overall as well, so they're a bit abnormal in that respect. And not only were they pecking each other a lot, um, they were pecking a lot the enrichments, the barn structures, the floor. And these birds were emergency trimmed. And trimming did just decrease pecking overall, not just injurious pecking, but pecking at everything else. And this is potentially an artifact of the hot blade trimming being both acute and chronically painful. The match control for this flock didn't have high pecking levels, injurious or otherwise. So not quite sure what was going on with this flock, but they were just a bit abnormal in the first place. And there may have been some management practices that contributed to their um, higher injurious pecking levels. The birds were, had limited access to the range for two to three weeks after placement in the laying shed. And they didn't have shelters close to pop holes, which again may decrease range use. And they also used a coarse cut wood chip instead of a finer wood shaving, which tends to be a lot uh, more standard to find. Um, as well, they said that they are getting farmers providing positive feedback about the experience. So, for example, one of them said it was the best feather flock he'd ever had. So kind of the lessons to be learned so far from what Bristol's finding is that it's important to have contingency plans in place. So know who the crews are who can catch and trim your flocks if needed. Also decide in advance when to start intervening. So when do you start assessing to make changes to the environment or management? And when do you decide this has been enough and you're going to trim the birds? And it's also important to follow as many of the recommendations as possible because they do tend to have an additive effect. So the more you can do, uh, the less, lower the risk is. And Bristol also recently launched their Featherwell website. And this gives information about um, strategies or methods to decrease injurious pecking all through uh, the birds' lives. And they're also hoping to get a forum going as well where people can post some um, questions, problems, and discuss them back and forth with each other. So in conclusion, I mean, we do seem to know a lot of ways to reduce injurious pecking and decrease the ways of it developing, but we still haven't completely abolished it. And realistically, there's actually still not a lot of intact beak research from this country yet. Now, other countries have successfully banned beak trimming, and I think at some point a UK ban will come. I'm not saying 2016, I'm saying someday in the future. So I think it's still important that we look ahead and be proactive. For, so for example, participating in studies, unlike the Bristol one or, or um, ours up in Scotland, so still doing things to work towards it, even if it's not going to be in the immediate future, not just becoming complacent and staying with what the norm is. Um, this is also a problem or a big issue because it has an ethical component. So do we fit the animal to the environment or the environment to the animal? And by that I mean do we change the environment so that the, the problems are lower stop, or do we change the animal so that the problem goes away? So are we ready to ban beak trimming right now? No, probably not. Um, will we be ready in 2016? Well, maybe it's possible, but it's going to require a lot of cooperation from industry, government, researchers. They'll need a lot of really good flock management planning and strategies. And to be honest, this is going to be a lot of hard work. However, I think we're still too early to uh, say yay or nay at this point. And I know it is frustrating because not knowing what's happening is quite stressful. But I think we do need further data from ongoing studies, new research, and then make an assessment after we have all the facts to decide if it will be possible or not. And I've just included some um, contact information. I know we have limited time today, so if you had questions or concerns you wanted to talk about later, you're welcome to contact myself, Krista, um, Vicky Santalans is a colleague of ours from SRUC, and Christine Nichol as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, please. We are on time, so there's no great panic as yet. Any questions from the floor? Yes, there's two. We'll, we'll take the back one first, John, and then we'll call the floor. Thanks, John. Paul McCall of Poultry Health Services. Uh, thanks, Laura, for that very detailed presentation on, on the problems that we're all very well aware of. 
In, in some respects, beak trimming is just like insurance. The difficulty is that the proposed approach essentially is don't pay your insurance, but be really, really careful and probably pay off with your bank manager so you can find one. Um, so I, I, how do we actually translate away from economic cost benefit into ec welfare cost be benefit? Because us veterinarians, we're not going to want to be approving reactive beak trimming. And we know that in the real world, you can't be perfect all of the time. So how can we change the politicians away from this fixation and think in real practical terms about welfare and not purely in, in theoretical ones? I didn't, sorry, it just didn't sound like I was on. Um, I mean, it's an, obviously it's a really difficult issue. And hopefully decisions aren't going to be knee-jerk reactions to you know, the public or whatnot. It will be based on informative research whichever way the research goes. And I mean, though if you, even with beak trimming, you still had problems with pecking. There were still peck-related mortalities. So uh, while I completely agree that trimmed birds damage less than intact um, beak birds, I think the problem was always there, and it always was a problem. So that's why it is important to continue to find ways of uh, managing the flocks with as little risk as possible. And hopefully maybe we can weed out people who aren't going to be interested in providing good management, who might be lazy about it, because do you really want them representing your industry anyway? They're not going to be the best they can be, and they're not going to care about the birds like the people who, who will be doing as much as they can to reduce the injurious pecking. But I agree, I mean, it is quite difficult, and it's a motive as well, which is one of the dangers, because you don't want policy decisions to be made based on feelings, it needs to be based on fact. Well, does that then cover the point you're making? Thank you very much. So, second question from Richard Higgins, John. Thanks, Richard. Hi, Richard Higgins, Bitterswell Farm. The countries you say have successfully banned beak tripping, which countries are they and do they still have an industry? They're <laughs> <laughs> Sweden, Switzerland, Finland, Austria. And I think, well, from talking to people, it seems to be that in general they do have smaller flocks, so 4,000 bird flocks. And as we said, flock size and stocking density do affect your pecking levels as well. So I think this might be one of the contributing <coughs> factors as, as why they're able to run their birds successfully. And, and when, it, when, it did, when they first did ban beak trimming, they kind of did just ban it and then deal with the consequences. So I know it was quite, quite bad for a bit when they first did it, and then they kind of managed afterwards. But no, they're, they're still successfully running intact birds with, with minimal issues. Those countries you just mentioned, most of them import most of their eggs, I believe. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, and I mean, it is up to the government as well, isn't it? Because hopefully your government is going to be defending your eggs and, and keeping those eggs that are produced at inferior standards <laughs> in an ideal world. <laughs> so, I mean, but obviously they're still in business, so whatever they're doing, they're doing it enough that they're, they're not, you know, all out of business. And yes, it's going to be difficult. And we're not exactly like them, and even the public perception is not exactly the same. So you can't say, well, yes, they've definitely done it, so we can definitely do it. But it is so useful to look at people who have been successful to see what you can gain from it or learn from it. Richard, you okay with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, excuse me, one last question if anybody's got something to follow up. Yes, the front row. Uh, Keith, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jim, uh, Jay Hodland Partners. Um, I think you said that birds always peck, you always get pecking. Well, birds. commercially. Yes. Yeah. Um, so looking at from the bird's point of view, would you rather be pecked by a bird with a trimmed beak or an untrimmed beak? I'd rather not be pecked at all. <laughs> <laughs> but you said it always happens. Birds will peck on you. Well, they, they will, and, but it is an artifact of commercial production. If you go in the wild and look at jungle fowl, which is the ancestor of our domestic chickens, they don't feather peck. They don't die from injurious pecking-related issues. I mean, there might be some aggressive deaths, but that's a completely different unmotivated behavior. So if you do look at where chickens came from, bird-to-bird -bird pecking is not a natural behavior. It's what we call abnormal behavior, or things that only start cropping up when you start doing things intensively. So, I mean... I mean, it would be trimming, it's a great band-aid solution, and it does 
protect bird welfare in its own way, but it's not solving the underlying issue of why the birds are pecking each other, especially to the point that they're killing each other or causing enough injury for the birds to be culled. Is that, um, yes, you okay with that? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Okay, well, please, <laughs> <laughs> no, very comprehensive um, look at what's happening. No conclusions yet, as you said. Let's not. No, I mean just yeah. Let's, let's not, not get ahead of ourselves. Let's Waiting not, is the worst, isn't it? That's it. Let's start assuming, for goodness' sake, let's not go out this room tonight to take a moment to watch the highlight that would be an absolute disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I think what Laura's saying there: all these management things need to be properly looked at and given its <coughs> proper length of time. Definitely. And I mean, when we've spoken to the farmer that are conducting the study, they're used to managing highlight as well. That's their kind of preferred strain to work with. Yeah. So obviously, if you have multiple you know, flocks of the same strain, you get better at managing them. So I mean, it is in that way a bit unfair for the lowlands to be put in, manage this highlands, the people who are um, happier at managing highlands. Yeah. Yeah. But it is just to, to illustrate there are genetic differences. So there will be differences between birds and between how they're just to cheer uh, Laura before we finish, and Lomond, I mean, we in Scotland have some over a quarter million birds, all Lomond, all organic, from different customers from Wick, probably to Lincoln, and they're all unbeat trained. And there's some results coming out of these organic talks, except for you. So it's all like this and how it can all fall into place. Laura, thank you very much for the paper. Please show your appreciation.